Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the December 4th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Friend? Here. If you'll join us in a brief moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any revisions or corrections to today's agenda? Uh, yes, we have a couple of um, corrections. Uh, number 16, uh, on the consent agenda, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 50. And then on item 18 on the consent agenda, agenda there's a correction. The item uh, should read, Adopt an ordinance amending chapters 13.01, 13.10, 17.10, and 17.12 of the Santa Cruz County Code pertain, pertaining to general plan zoning amendment, amendments, affordable housing requirements, residential density bonus, and affordable housing incentives, our combining district regulations, and including CEQA findings approved in concept on November 20th, 2018, adopt a resolution making findings of the general plan, LCP, and Coastal Act consistency and approving CEQA notice of exemption and take related actions as re recommended by the clerk of the board. In addition, on that item, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, packet page 89, which is resolution CEQA exemption attachment D. That concludes the corrections to the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Palacio. So are there any board members that want to pull any items from the consent or regular agenda this morning? Uh, okay, seeing none, we're going to open up public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items either on the consent agenda, items that are not on today's agenda but within the purview of the Board of Supervisors, or items on the regular agenda if you're unable to stay for the regular agenda. You'll have three minutes. Good morning and, and welcome. Welcome back, please. All right. First, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, my name is David Brody. I'm the Executive Director of the First Five Santa Cruz County Commission. I'm here this morning in particular to thank you, the Board of Supervisors, in particular Supervisor Coonerty, your incoming chair for next year, for issuing the proclamation declaring January 2019 Positive Parenting Awareness Month. Um, I'm not on. Oh, hey, I have a pretty big voice. So. <laughs> uh, this proclamation, as well as the actions of this board, once again demonstrate that this board, our county government, understands the quality of parenting that a child receives is one of the most powerful predictors of their long-term health and well-being. As noted in the proclamation, positive parenting can prevent or mitigate the effects of adverse childhood experiences such as child abuse, neglect, other traumatic events that are dangerous and create high levels of stress and impair lifelong health and well-being. At First Five, we are, of course, proud to serve as the backbone organization of our county's implementation of the Triple P Positive Parenting Program. As you all know, this is an internationally recognized, evidence-based program that with funding from First Five, as well as substantial in-kind and financial support from your health services agency, your human services department, and more recently in partnership with the county jail and the Cal Works department, um, has helped some 12,000 parents since its inception improve parenting practices, reduce stress and anxiety, and build a positive and healthy relationship with their kids. Uh, as I noted recently when I gave public comment in a recent article in the online publication Education Dive, uh, the article stated that if Rob Reiner uh, were to make a movie about First Five, he might choose Santa Cruz County for the setting. You knew I probably would say that again and again. I bring it up not simply uh, because we have led the implementation of Triple P at First Five, but more importantly because we have had partners, true community partners who have made substantial investments in the well-being of parents and their children. Investing not just in a single program, but a system of care that includes home visitation, authentic parent leadership, holistic pediatric care, and parental supports that include but are not exclusive to Triple P. On behalf of the First Five Santa Cruz County Commission, I want to thank you for this proclamation, again recognizing January 2019 as Positive Parenting Awareness Month. 
and for your ongoing support of families in Santa Cruz County. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your leadership. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, my name is Michael Spatafora. I am a business owner at the Gateway Plaza, and I'm here to talk about the large homeless encampment that is starting and has grown to probably about 50 to 60 tents now. Every morning we have, so I've been there for 20 years. That area keeps getting worse and worse. My landlords, who I'm actually speaking kind of on their behalf, and all the other tenants, our stores get broken into all the time. We've just had to double up our fence along the back behind Ross because they kept cutting it. Now they use it to hang all their stuff on. I don't have a problem with homeless people. I have a problem with the drugs and everything else that come with that. I have a problem with my customers being yelled at. I have, a, I have problems with you know our customers seeing things in the parking lot they shouldn't. You know, uh, people that frequent that uh, st that homeless area park right up against a levee. I have cop cars roll through there all the time. We pay for security from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. That comes out of our, the tenants, triple nets. Um, it's a constant uphill battle. Ross, um, Office Max, PetSmart, Cost Plus, their shrinkage is tens of thousands of dollars a year. I, I, I think Office Max lost like 11 grand a couple months ago. And this was before the camp moved in there. Now it's just, it, it's not the place for that. People can't walk from the tannery to and feel safe to walk from the tannery to the Gateway Plaza, from the other side of the freeway to the plaza. I understand that this is a city, mostly a city issue, but everybody I've talked to, I talked to the a mayor for about a half hour and I talked to the chief of police for about a half hour, and they all say they need help, more help from the county. Um, it's just, you know, we're, we're outrageous amounts of rent we pay, our landlord spends so much money keeping that property nice, I don't understand why they still have it. I mean, they're older, They've, they built that thing 25 years ago, and if I was them, I'd sell to a national company that would not care about that place like we that, that they do. I mean, the improvements they do and everything else they do, the landscaping, it's just, it's just a, a nightmare. I mean, I, I went to the city council meeting and they talked for a half hour about airplane noise and who was gonna go to the meeting for airplane noise. And then you guys are working on shampoo bottles. That's not stuff that keeps us awake at night. What keeps us awake at night is, am I gonna get a call at three o'clock in the morning because somebody smashed in my door like they do four times a year? I mean, a couple weeks, a couple months ago, everybody had their doors broken and, all their, and they went through all our stores. You know, police response time's bad. I mean, it's just, it's just we need help and apparently the city needs help from the, from the Board of Supervisors. Anything you guys can do would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good morning, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Hola, buenos días. Yo hablo español. Uh, buenos días, mi nombre es Diana Valadez. Soy una madre líder de, de la escuela de la IVOC de Cuna Carrera. Y quiero agradecer a la Junta por reconocer el importante papel que desempeña en los padres y cuidadores en la crianza de niños sanos y felices. Ser padre es un trabajo duro y gratificante. El condado de Santa Cruz tiene la fortuna de tener muchos programas y recursos disponibles para las familias. Como el programa de paternidad positiva, Triple P, ayuda mucho a que los padres se abran mucho con sus hijos y las familias. La iniciativa de la Evo de Cuna Carrera y otros programas proveen muchos servicios de Triple P que son muy útiles para nosotros como familias. Hispanas. Gracias por su tiempo. Gracias. Thank you. Morning, welcome. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Sandra Hernández. Soy una de las mamás de la escuela de la IVOC. Este, um, una de las de las cosas que, que nos motiva a nosotros como padres son parte de ellos las uh, Los talleres que nos dan de disciplina positiva, cómo lidiar con el estrés um, y otros, otros recursos y talleres que nos ofrecen. Uh, estamos muy contentos en nombre de, de, de familias de, de la Escuela de Laibok que nos ofrezcan este tipo de talleres porque nos ayudan mucho a aprender sobre la crianza de nuestros hijos eh, positivamente. 
para un mejor crecimiento y rendimiento para ellos al estar nosotros bien y que nos enseñen a, a cómo manejar todo uh, el estrés de llevar a los niños, de traerlos y todo lo que tenemos que, eh, que hacer uno como mamá, como padre, nos ayuda mucho y este, aprendemos Aprendemos cosas nuevas y es muy bueno saber que existen este tipo de programas y que los sigan apoyando. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. gracias. Ahí es su carta en español porque yo no, no oí todo no. lo que todo, ¿qué era lo que quería decir. Que queremos agradecer por los, uh, los talleres que tenemos. In, in the School of the Laibo. She just wanted to thank the board for um, everything that they have at the Live Oak School. Eh, los talleres que proporcionan eh, con una carrera que es de nosotros que venimos de, de esa, de la Escuela de Live Oak. And also for the careers. Eh, y queremos seguir teniendo más talleres. Que muchas gracias por los recursos que nos dan. And they just want to continue having those type of courses at Live Oak. And thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, good morning. My name is Josie Roberto. And first of all, I just wanted to say thank you to the board. We really appreciate the opportunity that you've given us to get legitimate and we're excited for this process and I just wanted to say thank you for that. And thank you to the staff. They've done an amazing job helping us make this tr transition and answering all of our questions. So it's going really well. I obviously am here because I just wanted to point out something that I think the board might want to pay attention to and it's timing. I, I see that and I'm hearing through planning there may be some bottlenecks with timing. Um, part of it is the change of use time could be six months to a year before you can even get your change of use permit and thus your cannabis licensing permit as well. It, timing has always been an issue for us to get established in this industry, especially for the small businesses. It also, recently I've heard that um, planning is not taking any applications for the month of December. Um, this could be a huge problem for many businesses here if they can't get in line and keep that process moving through the phase two licensing. So I just wanted the board to be aware of that. And um, I think the other thing is that I'm hearing is that planning is understaffed and that they need more help. And I'm hearing that from inside planning. So I just, I just thought these things, since this is a partnership, and um, the sooner we can get into business, the sooner we can get the revenue for the county and beautiful programs that are helping the youth, which I'm also thankful for because I'm raising kids here too. And uh, I think it could be beneficial for all, but we just have to look out for these bottlenecks. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker, please. Good, good morning. Welcome back. Good morning. I just wanted to make sure that the first speaker who spoke in Spanish also has the benefit of translation, Ms. Murillo. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. Um, I am here to speak about item 18 on the consent agenda. That is the uh, massive change to our county zoning code that does not really reflect uh, public planning policy, but rather the input of developers and bankers of Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I was very fortunate to be able to uh, financially attend and pay the $150 ticket <laughs> to go to the State of the Region um, event. And some of you, I saw you there, Supervisor Friend, you were a speaker in the broadband uh, round table. And that's where I really saw, that's where our public policy is coming from. And that alarms me as a member of the public. Monterey Bay Economic Partnership is a public-private um, organization. These changes that you are now reading for the second time to approve and adopt this policy came from that organization. 
directly, Sibley Simon's white paper is what got presented to the Housing Advisory Commission and what came to the Planning Commission and what you're adopting now. This is not good public policy, not transparent government at all. And as a member of the public, I am concerned and upset that my elected supervisors are glibly accepting policy changes made by private developers and bankers. Not necessarily for the benefit of the public, not necessarily serving the long-term needs, including infrastructure, which Supervisor Leopold, thank you, you tried so hard to get included in this legislation. Supervisor Coonerty, you would not allow it. Regarding relation to public transit, that's appalling and shocking to me as a member of the public that you would not allow that consideration for public future use of public transportation. I heard there from Ms. Mia Kang, a, a lobbyist and a CEO of Related California, a very large real estate developer. She pushed a lot of this legislation. She pushed SB 35, that's sponsored by Senator Scott Weiner, that really ties your hands and eliminates virtually the California Environmental Quality Act public process. As a member of the public, that really alarms me. And there is more legislation coming. What I heard over and over, we're gonna make state mandates. So you as elected officials only have to say, we have to do this because the state's telling us to, and you don't have to be worried about recall from the angry people who are upset about this process. This is not public policy. This is not transparent government. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome back. Thank you. Um, my name is Nina Simon. I'm the executive director of the MA, the Museum of Art and History at the McPherson Center. And I just wanted to come and say thank you to you personally. As you may have heard, uh, in 2019, I will be stepping down as the director of the MA to focus on sharing some of our innovative approaches to community involvement with other institutions around the world. And um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this museum would not exist without the county, but it would not be great the way it is today without all of your partnership. Over the last seven and a half years, um, we've gone from serving about 17,000 people a year to 148,000 people this past year. And we've done it in partnership with foster youth, with veterans, with fire artists, all kinds of people throughout our community. And um, when I think about the revitalization of the museum and the transformation of Abbott Square, the partnership with the county between the museum and the county has been part and parcel of that. And I just wanted to especially appreciate Supervisor Leopold, who's been so key to our community involvement processes at the museum, Supervisors McPherson and Coonerty, who really worked hard with the Abbott Square project, in addition to staff members Andy Schifrin, Melody Serino, Christina Maury, all of them were key to making that project a success um, and um, said, yes, let's figure it out when they could have said, no, we can't do that. Um, I also just really want to appreciate the partnership we've been able to have with Jeff Gaffney and with Ellen Timberlake. Um, having Jeff here and having a parks director who is energized about cultural participation has been incredible. And working with Ellen and the Human Services Department around both the Foster Youth Project and now the project we're doing around senior isolation really helps us fulfill our goal to use art and history to build a stronger community. Um, so I just wanna say thank you. I will be here for a few more months in this role and I expect to be in Santa Cruz County um, for a very long time to come. Um, and I hope that uh, I'll be able in a few months to come here and introduce you to the new director and I hope you'll be as great a partner to that person as you've been to me. Thank you. I want to thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank and thank you. you for your work. Yeah, thank you. You've energized, I mean, the 17,000 to 148 is phenomenal. It's, uh, it's nothing that we could have ever imagined. But so thank you very much for everything and having so much participation, so many people get involved in the arts that never were even sensitive to it at all. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. And we won't ever forget that you were also involved with a bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do more bus stops. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, Melody Serino, Deputy County Administrative Officer. I just wanted to take a moment this morning to introduce uh, Sam Laforte, uh, who is our new Cannabis Licensing Manager, and introduce him to the board. 
Sam, just stand stand up so they can recognize you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Welcome, Sam. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for uh, waiting. I'm Thomas Wilden representing uh, Nellie Cardoso, and uh, we need your help uh, to make sure and, uh, there's access uh, to a fantastic asset we have. Uh, that's the harbor, and we want to make sure we need your help to make sure that that access is not diminished. And she has prepared a statement for you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on that. Welcome, Carlos. Good morning, Supervisors. Carlos Landaverri. So, uh, Ms. Diana Valades spoke before in Spanish. She showed me a little bit of the text. And so, if, with your permission, I would like to translate or summarize what she spoke about. So, Diana Valades, a mother and leader from the program Cradle to Career and from Live Oak School. And she said, I would like to thank the Board of Supervisors for recognizing the important role that parents and child care providers um, play in raising strong and healthy and happy children. Being a parent, it's hard work, but it's great work. And the County of Santa Cruz is very fortunate to have many programs, many resources available for our families, such as the Positive Parenting Program, Triple P, and the Live Oak Initiative, Cradle to Career, and so many other programs. Algo más que me That's all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your leadership, uh, Diana. Uh, you, you've done an incredible job. Uh, and the cradle to career effort is successful uh, because parents are leading the way uh, in, in that effort. And I'm grateful for the partnerships we have with groups like uh, First Five, uh, the County uh, Human Services Department, uh, the, um, uh, the school district, but it's really the parents and people like you who make the difference. Thank you. And I, I will continue doing that as far as long as I can. <laughs> Anybody else? All right. Good morning. Hello, everybody. Microwave radiation from wireless facilities is dangerous biologically. And uh, it's proven. I'm going to give you a copy of Dr. Sharon Goldberg testifying before Michigan's 5G small cell tower legislation. It's a hearing from October uh, 4th of this year. The DVD also has Dr. Martin Paul speaking about the autism epidemic from electromagnetic frequencies. These are scientists. This is proven to be harmful. It's not debatable. And one of the things she states in here to roll out 5G, a new application of a technology documented, known to be harmful, is irresponsible and dangerous. It's a 15-minute thing, so I'm going to leave you with this. At the same time that you expressed your opposition to a bill at the federal level to roll out 5G, you in this county are issuing permits for 4G, which is the foundation for 5G, and it's all harmful. Uh, as almost as fast as it can go um, in the public right of way and she points out that the blood sugar level, the diabetes increases is documented of people who live near these cell sites emitting radiation. So to put these on utility poles every 10 homes all over, it's just going to increase the uh, damage. 
one of the places in the county has applications for cell sites and the public right of way. They use Zach Friend for the leadership uh, role according to your age to have 13 in the Aptos area on one square mile, which I don't appreciate. I do not feel represented by you for protecting our public health and well-being. Another site coming up in this very room, there's gonna be a meeting this Friday uh, about Wilson Tires at the corner of Porter and Soquel Drive, right near many schools for 4G and uh, people in the neighborhood are pretty upset about this. You, as leaders, should be halting these applications and stopping this microwave onslaught. Um, and I will leave you with this. And you, uh, also a, a letter you. from former superintendent of Santa Cruz schools on Thank this you. very topic. Good morning. Good morning, supervisors. Um, I came to uh, say the same thing Mary said, and I wanna give her acknowledgement. She's here all the time telling you guys about the dangers of radiation. Um, and I do feel the radiation from my smartphone when I use it on my ear. Um, anyways, the 5G network is very dangerous for our kids, for our families. Um, I'm just a, I'm a complete no on this Verizon 5G network, and I'm a request that you guys actually really look into um, how this affects everybody, because you know how good is too good. You know the the millimeter wave bandwidth um, shoots like a, a laser beam to each cell phone, and if you're in that direct line of sight, you'll be getting a lot of radiation and damage. And so maybe we get great internet, and we can have those vehicles that drive by wire, completely com computer controlled on the 5G network but there's a tremendous health impact. And I know you guys were all here for the smart meters and you know for the smart meter opt out and there's tremendous health impacts from people that sleep next door to smart meters. So you are the guys are the ones that can really make a difference to really look into these corporations, to these big businesses that are in cahoots um, with, with the, 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 the bigger governments pushing this 5G network saying it's good for us when it's really damaging. And it's, if, you know, it's, it's for our future generations and our kids not to be messed up, not to have their um, tumors and radiation and all that stuff. So I'm a complete no on this. I just ask you guys to really look in the 5G. I thank Mary for being here all the time. You know, she's, a, she's an amazing asset, an amazing ally in, in letting you know the dangers. Um, so I wanted to say that and um, yeah, you know, uh, keep keep looking into everything, you know, because you are the guys that are elected officials and we're looking to you for your leadership. And, um, you know, I'm here to support and represent you as a citizenry. So I actually have more time and I'll yield. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. I'm Dr. Scott Sawyer. I have a business at 700 River Street, so it's at the corner of Highway 1. Just to echo that last gentleman's comments about cell phone uh, radiation, if you do the research, there's more angioglioma tumors now than there's ever been, and for the first time in history, uh, we're seeing them in children. And an angioglioma is a tumor that shows up in the temporal lobe of the brain, which we've never seen before in children. We're seeing more of them now, and it's from the cell phone radiation, which doesn't necessarily cause cancer. That's the argument that the telecommunication companies you're using against or to tell us that it doesn't cause cancer. Kind of like in the 50s when the tobacco industry told us that cigarettes don't cause cancer, but they were the one that funded the studies. So we're seeing a huge increase in angiogliomas that uh, we should be really concerned about. So that's on the topic that he was talking about. But that wasn't why I got up here. Um, I'm at 700 River Street, which is where the homeless tent city has appeared. And I'm just asking for any support that you can provide to get that cleaned up. Uh, I've cleaned up human feces off my doorstep. Two weeks ago, I had a woman come running in in tears because her child, they were coming in for an appointment, a doctor's appointment, and her child witnessed a man shooting up right on our front door who lives in that homeless camp. 
uh, with blood running down his forearms. And I ran out and I said, what are you doing? And he said, don't worry, man. I don't throw my needles away. I pick them all up. So that was his rationale for being able to do his drugs right there in front of our office. So anything that you can do to clean that up would be most appreciated. It's already having a huge effect on our sales for businesses for um, the holiday shopping, which is usually a big draw for all of us in the shopping center. That's dropped off. People don't feel safe. And it's right under our Welcome to Santa Cruz River Street sign where that homeless camp is. So when people come to Santa Cruz and you think, oh, welcome to Santa Cruz, they don't even notice the sign anymore. They notice the tent city. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else during public comment? Okay, we'll close public comment and move on to the consent agenda. Uh, Supervisor Caput, are there any comments you'd like to make on the consent agenda? No, thank you. Thank you, good morning. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson, nothing? Uh, good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Nope. That's a talkative group. Uh, good morning, Supervisor <laughs> Leopold. Uh, not to disappoint, uh, Chair. <laughs> not, yeah. I have a couple things. Please. Uh, on item 18, I'd like to record a no vote. <laughs> On uh, item 24, which is the Cannabis Licensing Office report, I uh, uh, appreciate uh, that we have a new leader there and I look forward to working with him. Um, the concern uh, raised uh, uh, by the speaker about planning and not being able to get in there for a month, is that accurate? Do we know whether that's true? I, I do not know. You wanna, you probably come up to the microphone. I don't know. I can't speak for them. I know that they're in the process of hiring right now some additional planners, um, and but I'll be happy to check into that and get back well, to you. Looks like the assistant planning uh, director is coming. Wanda. <laughs> good morning, Ms. Williams. Good morning, Chair Friend and board members. Um, at this time, there is no delay in processing of cannabis applications. There is a pre-application process that all applicants must adhere to uh, in going through the cannabis office. Um, as of this date, if someone were to come in and go through, go to the cannabis office and um, adhere to the pre-application requirements, we would be able to meet with them in planning very quickly, probably within five to 10 days, and begin to process their application. Most applications, as you know, are processed at a level three, and therefore it's very likely that within 30 to 45 days they would have a final determination on an application. So there are no delays. It is um, the pre-application process, uh, which is intended to um, detect early on any flaws, um, or missing items so that uh, once they come in and file the application, it is a streamlined process. Well, I'd appreciate if you met with the, 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 the speaker uh, uh, before everybody leaves here to make sure that that's not, uh, that that's communicated as, as, as clearly as possible. I think it's in I would be glad to do that. We are also going back and looking at our website uh, to try and identify if we can um, add any additional clarification or information to allay any concerns or fears of cannabis applicants. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the report and the useful information in there. Uh, I, I, I would appreciate in the future if we could also get some comparative information with the other jurisdictions in the county. Um, uh, at least the information I've been shared is that we're behind a lot of the other, uh, uh, the, the two cities that have uh, uh, issued license and uh, it seems to me with a five-person cannabis licensing office and everything, we should, we should be able to um, process our applications more effectively. So I look forward to that in the future. Uh, and I look forward to w working with Mr. Laforte. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Then is there a motion on the consent agenda? I move the consent agenda. Second. So there's a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty recognizing the registered no vote on that one item. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move on to the regular agenda. We'll begin with item seven. Item seven is a public hearing to consider transparent review of unjust transfers and hold act regarding Immigration and Customs Enforcement access to individuals and to receive and consider public comment pursuant to Government Code Section 7283 and 7283.1 as outlined in the memo of the Sheriff Coroner. We have the board item and the 2017 ICE releases. We have a presentation this morning. Welcome back. Good morning. 
Feel free to come through. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Sorry. Fit in here. Good morning. And I'm Chief Deputy Jeremy Verinsky with the Santa Cruz Sheriff's Office, and I just wanted to draw your attention to Exhibit A, which was attached in the board packet, which has our statistical data as required by the Truth Act. This is our first time conducting this public hearing, so I think it's going to be a little bit of a learning process for all of us, but I'm here if there's any questions or comments from the public or if we have any concerns. Thank you, and, and my understanding is that we're required to hold some sort of public forum. We have this as a public hearing at the Board of Supervisors where this information has to be presented to the public, correct? Yes. Okay. Are there any questions from board members on this item before we open up the public hearing for the community? Uh, all right, we'll open up the public hearing. Is there anybody from the community that would like to address us on item seven? Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I don't have internet access at home, and it's difficult for me to research things. And for the benefit of those um, watching this live stream, can you please give a brief description of these policies that we're having a public hearing about this morning? I support um, transparent government, and I support um, a good relationship with law enforcement while uh, protecting the security and well-being of those in our community that are affected by this policy. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else during the public hearing? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and uh, bring it back. Just as a brief introduction that might be useful, as I'd mentioned earlier, so in 2016, the legislature had passed the Truth Act uh, regarding uh, ICE deportation programs specifically in regards to our local jails. So this item provides uh, information about uh, ICE holds and deportation associated with it. However, in May of 2017, the Sheriff's Office ceased working with ICE uh, absent uh, a court order, and so there haven't been any ICE-related incidents associated with our local jail since May of 2017. Uh, they outline uh, the few that were in the few months preceding, which is what the, the staff report shows. Is there something else you'd like to add, Chief Rinsky? Sure, I'll just give you a brief overview. Um, the, what came first was the Trust Act in 2013. California has been uh, restricting and, and modifying uh, our involvement with ICE for a number of years. So in 2013, the Trust Act was passed, also known as AB4, um, which limited uh, those items or those uh, um, contacts that we could have with ICE. It was further restricted by the Truth Act in 2016, um, which is the genesis of this report today. And then last year, uh, the California Values Act, uh, also known as SB 54, was passed. Uh, I do want to point out Sheriff Hart was the, uh, the first and only sheriff statewide to endorse the California Values Act. And you can see reflected in their statistics you know, at that time that we ceased all contact with ICE um, and have had no further contact with them uh, since then. So uh, we are no longer turning over anybody um, to ICE uh, directly from our jail system. Any other questions? Uh, Supervisor Leopold, please. Well, uh, not as much of a question, as just an appreciation for the sheriff and, and the department for its leadership on, on this issue. Uh, people in Santa Cruz <coughs> County have felt very strongly for a long time uh, about the, the need for us to, to, to disengage uh, from uh, working with immigration, and I know that the sheriff went through a number of steps, but his uh, leadership in supporting SB 54, I think, was actually helpful in terms of getting the measure passed. And I also appreciate uh, the work that the sheriff's office is doing to, uh, with through its advisory council, uh, to uh, to talk to the community and listen to what the community has to say. Um, and its efforts to diversify the workforce uh, to reflect the diversity of the community. I think those are all important parts of making sure that the, that the, the sheriff and the sheriff department um, uh, reflect what the people in Santa Cruz County want, and I just want to express my appreciation. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion? Uh, I move the recommended actions. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you, Chief Rinsky, for taking the time. Thank you.
Uh, we'll now move on to item eight, which is to consider report and presentation on the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System pilot program that provides funding for substance use disorder services to direct health services to return with an annual status reports beginning in December of 2019 and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the Director of Health Services. We have the agenda board item and the annual report from 2018. Morning, Ms. Hall. Good morning, Chair Friend. I don't think it is, so it's yeah. at the base. Okay, thank you. Good morning, Chair Fend, Honorable Board of Supervisors. We're pleased to be here today to give the update on the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System. I'd like to introduce Shana Zura, who is our Chief of Substance Use Disorder, and she'll be providing the presentation today. Before she begins, I just wanted to set the stage and remind the board of the why, of why we decided to do this as a county. Um, <clears throat> on the heels of the Affordable Care Act and expanding access to Medi-Cal coverage to primarily childless adults, uh, the state also entered into a state waiver that allowed counties to choose to uh, do this DMC, DMC ODS system. And um, the, the why behind it is that we have an opportunity now and into the future to dramatically expand access to our substance use disorder services, which we know is a need in our county. Uh, not only uh, access to services, but to also expand the variety and the types of treatment modalities that we can provide to our constituents. And, uh, and then the added gravy on top of that is we get to draw down federal funds for this. One of the things I'd like to remind you of is those individuals who are newly covered through Medi-Cal through the Affordable Care Act, when we provide services to them through Medi-Cal, uh, we draw down 90% reimbursement as opposed to 50% reimbursement for those prior eligible to Medi-Cal. So all of these things combined set the perfect stage and opportunity for us as a county to, again, dramatically shift access to uh, services for, to substance use disorder treatment to our beneficiaries. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shana Zura. Good morning, supervisors. So as a refresher, the Drug Medi-Cal Organized Delivery System is a statewide waiver in partnership with the federal government to expand substance use disorder services, and Santa Cruz County opted into that waiver um, with services commencing on January 1st of this year. The system is driven by the American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria. Um, this assessment is utilized both for the individual beneficiary to determine the medical necessity of the intervention, um, but also for all of our treatment providers to determine what services they can best provide, and then we're able to match the beneficiary with the appropriate level of care with the appropriate provider. And these services are available to all county residents with active Medi-Cal who meet that medical diagnostic criteria for substance use disorder interventions. We operate a continuum of care. We begin with prevention and early intervention services, um, moving into outpatient and intensive outpatient services. The primary difference between these two modalities is dosage. For our adult residents in outpatient, they're going to get less than nine hours of service. Um, and if they scale up into that intensive outpatient service, it's going to be a minimum threshold of nine and up to 20 hours. Um, and for our youth in outpatient, it's a threshold of up to six in outpatient and then exceeding six in intensive outpatient services. For folks who need more crisis management and acute services, we can move them into our uh, low intensity and high intensity residential services. Um, the Medi-Cal system utilizes residential as a crisis intervention, um, acute services to stabilize folks that are in imminent danger as related to their substance use disorder. Um, and then on the high end of our continuum, we have withdrawal management. These are detoxification services for folks that need that extra level of supervision uh, prior to entering into a residential service modality. So depending on the presentation of the person, um, they can scale up or down in services in our system. When I was here in December of 2017, we discussed that adoption of this program executed an entitlement program for our community. Um, we talked about a budget projection where we were looking at the potential deficit of $1 million in year two. Um, we discussed how federal changes uh, could impact future funding. 
Um, and our service projection over time was to increase by 100%. Um, so serving more folks and serving them with a wider array of services. Throughout the implementation year, we've seen a number of cultural shifts within our treatment communities that have been necessary to meet the needs of our community. Um, one of those is a variable treatment episode length. We are not offering, for example, a 30-day residential stay or a 90-day stay in outpatient services, but instead utilizing that American Society of Addiction Medicine criteria, we conduct ongoing assessments for each beneficiary, um, either weekly or bimonthly, to determine what level is most appropriate, and then as their symptoms decrease and they achieve a higher level of wellness, we can scale them down in programming. Um, and should their, their needs become more acute, we can scale them up um, in a timely manner. We have an emphasis on uh, progressing towards self-identified goals, so empowering our beneficiaries to identify what it is in their lives that they'd like to change and building that into treatment planning so they are driving their own service provision. Um, we're evolving our criminal justice mandates. Historically in this community, um, many residential treatment beds were utilized as jail diversion. So we had a large number of folks that were serving the end of their jail stays in a residential setting, regardless of any kind of medical assessment as to whether that level of care was appropriate for their substance use disorder needs. Um, so we've done a lot of partnership with our court systems, with our judges, with probation, with the sheriff's department to look at how we intersect the criminal justice department and substance use disorder services, continuing to provide services uh, for those who are criminally justice involved who need services, but making sure that they are medically driven. For example, we're seeing that judges are mandating folks to ha have an ASAM assessment and be compliant with the outcome of that assessment. Um, and then I just want to highlight universal implementation of harm reduction. Harm reduction is in it of itself a continuum that uh, creates a space uh, for folks to get services whether they are identified as someone who wants to achieve abstinence relatively quickly and that is their goal uh, for folks that are in various stages of change who are unsure about what kind of changes they want to make to their substance use um, and even folks who are not sure that there's an issue with their substance use. This uh, allows us the opportunity to provide services for all. In terms of budget status, um, for 17-18 we ended up with a surplus. Uh, this is in part because we were commencing services for a half a year, it wasn't a full um, funding year. In 18-19 we had projected that $1 million deficit. We were able to utilize some additional funds to roll through, um, balance the budget in 18-19 and we're projecting that at the end of this fiscal year we'll have a deficit of a little over 44000 for our 1920 projection, we are showing you um, a, a 700 to 1 million deficit. Um, however, a couple of things I want to highlight about that. That is a projection that is based on current service capacity, and we do not anticipate that is what 1920 will look like. We have some additional expansion happening. Um, part of the reason for this lag is that the complexities of the services um, have created slower ramp up and implementation than some of our providers initially projected. Um, so we're anticipating bringing some new services online. We also have the opportunity on an annual basis to do a deep dive into actual costs and re-engage in negotiations with the state about the amount that comes into our community. Um, so that will give us an opportunity to do that deep dive and also uh, renegotiate our funding. There are a couple of major funding factors that I want to bring to your attention. They are the federal financial participation and the federal Medi-Cal assistance percentage. The FFP is the federal government's share of those expenditures under Medi-Cal. And feasibility of this system really depends on that FFP um, and the types of services that are eligible for this match. So we are reliant on a projection of that number. The way that we calculate that um, is the FMAP, and it is determined, as Mimi mentioned, by the type of Medi-Cal a beneficiary receives. It can range from 50% to 90%. This is one of the places where we talk about federal shifts can impact that. Um, but also what we do is we project what we think our community is going to receive in terms of benefits and use that to create really complex grids of budgets that are interrelated across our providers. Changes in this mix can significantly increase or decrease that federal drawdown. So this is one of the reasons that it's a complex system to project. In terms of planned expansion, uh, we have uh, 
Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, an organization that has submitted their drug Medi-Cal certification, and so they are anticipating uh, in the near future offering 175 youth slots, including youth-based services for both prevention and service provision. We have a residential provider, uh, New Life, who is working on their drug Medi-Cal certification, and that offers a potential of up to 38 additional residential beds in our community. We've acknowledged that we need more withdrawal management support through our implementation. And so right now we're looking at out of county providers to support that need. The primary reason we're looking out of county is space. Um, we have not been able to identify space within our community to expand our existing withdrawal management services with our existing providers. Um, so as we continue to try to navigate that barrier, utilizing out of county providers will get our community into services rather than being stopped by that need. And then in terms of outpatient services, uh, we're looking at implementation of county behavioral health service billing under drug Medi-Cal, so another expanded service modality. And right now, we're projecting that we're going to utilize services to, um, to target folks that are duly diagnosed, so folks that have significant mental health issues and are also simultaneously struggling with substance use disorder to broaden um, a, a gap in our existing services. When we look at our modality match, um, we found that of an audit of health records, between 97 and 98% of beneficiaries that were assessed during the, using the ASAM criteria were matched with that appropriate level of care, so that's a great success story for us. To walk you through some of the data, we'll look at um, Q1 and 2 of 17-18, which was prior to ODS services. 17-18 uh, Q4 and 18-19 Q1 are three quarters of live ODS services. And then we have some projections uh, which assume that services are provided at the level that we are currently contracted out. So you can see significant increases in outpatient services. Um, intensive outpatient, because it's a little bit of a, a difficult threshold, folks have to meet that minimum of nine hours a week, can be a little more difficult to engage. We're seeing significant increases in uh, residential admissions as well as our withdrawal management services. Total admissions, uh, we have seen a spike and we also anticipate another spike with addition of service provision. Um, and we have raised our number of unduplicated beneficiaries significantly. Another way to look at data is days of service, how much was provided, whether that's an outpatient contact or a residential bed. Um, so outpatient services, again, you can see significant increases. We also have increased our withdrawal management bed days and residential. Um, this is actual data, there's no projections here. This is what we have been able to demonstrate through the organized delivery system implementation. So for 2018, uh, our focus has been equitable access for the community regardless of their presentation and identified stage of change. Um, we have more people accessing more services than ever before. They are assessment-driven services to meet each beneficiary exactly where they are. We are learning the system budget projections and we'll circle back with what we hope to be some more solid data on our 1920 budget projections and we're continuing to ramp up service provision. Thank you, that was an outstanding presentation. Thank you for walking us through the history of it too. Are there any questions from board members on this item? Supervisor McPherson. There, it's, it's up in the air about the projections of the cost factor, of course, that's, and that's it was 700,000 to a million dollars. When will we get a better sense of that? Will it be after the federal government uh, gets involved in this with its budget or if it ever should come to pass? Yeah, it's a great question. So we're not necessarily pending what's happening on the federal budget level. What we are doing is we are looking at how quickly we can ramp up services. We're looking at existing data to see what our actual service costs are. So we anticipate in the next couple of months that we'll have a better picture and that picture should be refined as we get closer to 1920 fiscal year. And I just wanted to add and emphasize that those projections are based on the the amount of services we're currently providing and we're currently adding a number of additional services and expanding access so when that happens it'll also draw to, uh, give us the ability to draw down additional funds. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Caput. I, I want to thank you for all the work you're doing and thank you for the report. Uh, this is related uh, to um, the, the mental health uh, facility opening up in uh, Watsonville, there's an overlap there, right, uh, of some sort. Uh, 
what we're talking about here is related to the homeless issue. It's related to the mental health issue. It's related to the economy. What you're doing is really in the, uh, the trenches of a lot of problems that are going on. So the South County facility will house all behavioral health services. So there will be services for adults and children um, that are related to mental health and substance use disorder services. And so it will be an opportunity to expand the footprint of us SUD services in the Watsonville community. Absolutely. That'll be great. I, th I think this is something we really need to uh, support. And I want to thank you again. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for the ongoing work. You know, we get, uh, as, as you heard this morning, we get a lot of requests for help uh, dealing with folks who are experiencing substance use disorder. And the, uh, the effort that the county has made to do the drug Medi-Cal waiver program is one of those stretches that we are making in order to expand treatment. So I was very happy uh, to see uh, some of these numbers where we have seen uh, such a great uptake, 30% increases in, in uh, the level of participations and, and uh, hundreds of more people being able to uh, seek treatment. Uh, so I think that is, um, that's beginning to help meet the need that's out there. And uh, I'm glad to hear that there are new additional services coming on board. Uh, I did want to uh, ask in terms of um, the withdrawal management and the out of county service provider, how does that work? I mean, the, um, if it's an out-of-county provider, are we expecting people going to be going over the hill? Is there another way to do that? Sure. If you could share. So there seems to be a shortage of withdrawal management uh, service opportunities across the state. So it's not unique to our community. Um, what I have done in terms of thinking about out-of-county services is essentially drawn concentric circles that have gotten larger and larger and look to the communities around us of who has capacity. Right now, unfortunately, the closest provider is located in San Francisco. That creates a significant transportation barrier sure. for our folks. So I've been partnering with the Central Alliance uh, to facilitate transportation as transportation to and from substance use disorder services is part of the medical plan. Um, and what we are projecting to do is utilize probably ambulance transportation. Because folks are going to a withdrawal management episode, it means that they are either under the influence or uh, at acute risk for withdrawal symptoms in that potentially 90 minute period of transportation. So it's important that they have appropriate medical oversight during that time. But we are working towards a seamless transition where uh, they will be assessed by a local provider, be picked up with the appropriate transportation from that provider, transported to San Francisco to that facility, engage in their withdrawal management stay, which averages about five days, and then transported by the Alliance from that withdrawal management facility back directly into a local residential bed. Um, that is the plan, that's the projection. We have not given up hope that we can identify space within our community to expand withdrawal services, and we have providers that are willing to do that. For example, um, one of the conversations I've been having on an ongoing basis is with Watsonville Hospital and whether there's potentially capacity there. Um, so it's a two-pronged approach. Great, I mean, the, having someone have to go to San Francisco through ambulance is a very expensive option, and uh, the more we can work to, to build that capacity here, uh, the better off everyone will be uh, with that. Um, you mentioned the increase of uh, school uh, service slots. Uh, it sounded like it was only in one school district, um, the Pyro Valley School District, and um, they're not the only ones who have students who uh, uh, might be fa facing substance use disorder issues. Have there been conversations with other school districts in the county uh, about also uh, working to uh, create slots? Absolutely, there are ongoing dialogues about how we bring these services into various schools within our county. So while I highlighted PVPSA as a new uh, drug medical provider, we have Encompass Community Services, who is an existing youth treatment provider, right. and they have been uh, working on their youth ramp up services that will have presence in schools as well. Great, throughout the county. Correct. Um, I wonder if you could uh, just uh, let, fill us in as to the recently touted opioid legislation at the federal level, how that affects our own efforts with uh, drug Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. or does it? 
Frankly, not yet. We have not seen a significant shift. Um, with that legislation needs to come dollars to support changes. Um, we do, through this program, have that federal support. Um, we have not seen a, a grand expansion of that at this point. Yeah, it's very disappointing that they, they tout these, uh, that they're fighting the opioid epidemic, but they haven't provided the resources to, in order to effectively do it. And, and Santa Cruz has a problem, but there's a lot of other communities across the country that are facing much bigger problems with, mm -hmm. with it. And the loss of life and impact to communities is, is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, as we look out at the 700,000 uh, to a million dollars that might, we might be facing next year, I understand that's a projection, it's good change with increased capacity. But do you, it, uh, have you looked at any further than one year? Um, and is there a, does that level off? Does that go down? What's your, th what's your thought? We have not yet uh, dove into that, in part because the waiver is through 2020, um, and there may be some systemic changes that will impact that. Um, part of the acknowledgement last year as we talked about going into the waiver is it becomes an entitlement, um, but there is a sort of finite period of time, and so we await some statewide and federal direction on how that will progress. Okay. Well, I hope uh, uh, we'll oh, go oh, on. Oh, Supervisor Leopold, excuse me. I just wanted to add that, um, yes, the, the waiver is finite, and we have some changes coming down that we can't predict, including um, what the will of the new governor is, um, if there is success in these demonstration projects across California enough to make some federal changes. And so those are all things that we're playing a wait-and-see attitude, but we definitely think it was worthwhile to participate, and we feel like, at least on uh, Santa Cruz County's behalf, We've pro proven that this is definitely a great way to increase access to care. Yeah, well, I, I, to, to have the extra slots and the different varieties um, makes a difference. And when we hear the statistics about 97, 98 percent actually receive the treatment that uh, is recommended is a credit to uh, the success of matching people to the appropriate services. And uh, I hope that, that uh, given the nature of this epidemic across the country, um, where we've seen life expectancy in this country go down because of the opioid epidemic, um, that, uh, that the federal government is actually committed to providing resources to really make a difference. Uh, thank you for your ongoing work, and I look forward to continue um, uh, updates about how this program is going. Thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for your work from a financial perspective and an operational perspective. This was a major, major lift, um, and it was an important thing to do in the community, and I really appreciate that you sh we're seeing signs of success across the board because it was it was daunting uh, from a several different levels to, to launch this program, and I'm proud of this county for taking this step. Um, the, the, the critique or the, the question I have is still about, at the end of the day, this is about getting people the treatment they need and improving their lives, and how much are we attracting after they leave treatment, six months later, a year later, are they, uh, are they still sober, are they using less, are they less involved in our criminal justice system, have they worked through CalWORKs to find jobs and employment, are we, are we making sure that we're aligning not just these services but all of our other services to get the best possible outcome for the individuals uh, on the ground. And I understand we're, you know, we're essentially six months in, uh, so it's, it's still early, but I want to make sure that we're putting uh, measures in place to track success so we know that when we spend these funds, uh, we're getting the outcomes for the individuals and for the communities that we want and that we're aligning all of our other programs uh, with them. So hopefully when you come back next year with even more news, um, you do uh, that those sites, types of statistics are included. The second thing is, and this is following up on Supervisor Leopold's comments, which is we hear an enormous amount of frustration from this community about the impacts of uh, drug use on quality of life and on people's families and, and, and from individuals. And I don't know that we've done a good job. There's a lot of good information in here that we need to know from a, from a policy-making point of view and a, and a fiduciary's point of view. But I think we need to be out telling the story of this. We're one of six counties in California who are out taking this major effort, who took a big risk, who scaled up the program, who have dramatically expanded treatment services across the spectrum um, so that people know that it's not just uh, as some of the previous uh, 
folks turning on our communication. We aren't just focused on these smaller issues. These, this was a major investment to address one of the biggest issues facing our community, and we have to be able to go out with clear data and explain to people that, you know, we, uh, whatever it is, a 60% increase in treatment beds are available in this community that weren't available last year because we're providing them. And so um, working with uh, our public information folks in order to go out and tell that story, to get out to the media and to organizations and tell that story I think is incredibly important. So building that in, in addition to, uh, to building the, the plane after you jumped off the cliff or whatever the metaphor is, <laughs> um, I think is, uh, is, uh, is, is really important because I think we can, if we can show six, if we could show this community that one, we recognize the problem, two, we're taking major steps to solve it, and three, we're having success, um, it'll go a long way towards supporting more programs like this as we move forward. Uh, thank you, I agree with what was said there, and I'd like to, I know people have been waiting to open it up to the community for an opportunity for people to address us on this exceptionally important item. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Becky Steinbrenner, resident of Aptos. Thank you for your good report. Um, and thank you, Supervisor Coonerty, for bringing up the issue of tracking the success of this. I think that's one of the questions I had too, and it, it harkens my memory back to the report that your board heard about women in jail, how they go through the, the time and then they get out and there's no, no support there to help them carry on with their life changes that they have um, experienced while in, in jail, while in treatment, and they come right back. So I would like also to have some um, information about tracking these, the success of these in the ongoing, and I realize it's an early program, but um, I think that's key to really showing that this works and to continue to get further funding. Um, I think it's interesting that this program receives 90% reimbursement from Manical versus 60%, and that's a real great thing to help fund these sorts of programs, and um, I hope that the waiver gets extended. I have some questions um, about, um, I just want to make sure I've heard uh, residents, Mr. Crane was here at the last board meeting uh, talking about the problems that um, non-transparency with uh, these inpatient places being put in residential zones and I want to make sure that your board has heard that clearly and that your program has heard that clearly and that in the future, when looking for future sites, they do not get put in residential zones. And I also want to make sure that we're not going to participate in the safe injection sites. Um, I'm really against that. Um, I want to also point out, um, Supervisor Leopold, you brought up the issue of transporting out of county. I want to remind this board that you have approved uh, a, a substantial contract with Salinas Yellow Cab to do just this, and I hope that that service is being used. That owner pr uh, purchased several new taxi cabs because of this contract, and it is to allow um, services like this to, uh, and is incur includes paying a support person to monitor someone that is being transported. So I hope that you know that <laughs> and that this board remembers that because it was a, a very substantial contract with Salinas Yellow Cab. I also would like some information about place of residence, uh, former place, place of residence. We hear a lot of talk from the public that we have such good programs, it brings people in. And so I would like some tracking of where these people lived or were before they came here. I think that's responsible uh, government to address the use of public funds and to address the public's concern here. Um, I'm concerned that the numbers are going up and I hope that's because Thank you. the services are available and people are being no uh, notified about them. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to address us on this item? I wrote down some of your comments, Supervisor Coonerty. Um, we're hearing impact of drug use and we need to recognize the problems and take steps to improve it. Um, one 
uh, substance abuse. And I think this is critical to take into consideration, and I'll give this to you, is the neuropsychiatric impacts of the exposure to the microwave radiation from all these wireless sources. And I, indications my tremors are related to this exposure as well. This Dr. Sharon Goldberg speaks of the costs, like you're discussing here, and the disorders people are experiencing, including the opioid epidemic, the mental disorders. And again, this report, anyone can see it on YouTube. Dr. Sharon Goldberg testifies that Michigan's 5G small cell tower legislation hearing, October 4th, 2018, also, Dr. Martin Paul is talking about the autism epidemic uh, from electromagnetic frequencies. Now, it just happened today. So what are some of the causal effects? And definitely, people are talking about addictions to cell phones getting one's brain blasted with microwave radiation that damages the neurons permanently, has damaged firefighters. You've been given evidence of that as well. Um, it's not something that promotes health. It's the opposite. This is an addiction for sure. So. Um, I, I'm going to give you this, and just by chance today, on the bus coming here, I saw a friend of mine, uh, and she's a Medi-Cal recipient. And what happened to her brain tumor from using her cell phone, age 30? She was headed to Dominican for an appointment with, to get chemotherapy. She tells me that the chemotherapy treatment she had, we're talking about drugs, right, cost to med Medi-Cal, um, they didn't work. And she had to have four blood transfusions the last time. I, th this, uh, this is causing huge, you talked about the deficit, huge costs to, you know, healthcare services. Thank you, Ms. Garrett. Due to the radiation from Thank wireless. you. Anybody else like to address us on the drug Medi-Cal program? Thank you. Morning, welcome Morning. back. Morning. Tony Crane, Aptos resident. Uh, I'm becoming kind of a regular here now. Got even quoted there. Um, I, I didn't plan on speaking today. I did get here a little bit late, but um, sounds like a great program once again and things that we need in this county. My concern from personal experience is the integrity of data received. I appreciate uh, Mr. Coonerty saying, you know, tracking and all of that is very important to make sure that these are effective heard the increase in the bed count um, for actual people to get what they need is important, but the validity of the data received when making assessments of going forward is really important. And um, I found that uh, transparency and the data is n not necessarily um, the best that it could be. So that would just be my one comment, is that if these programs are gonna be successful and you're gonna go get more money in the future, that the integrity of data received after the treatment is really important and that the programs are Im implemented properly um, and bed increase, oh, sorry, do I have to buy everybody donuts? Um, it's, it's just important that the follow-up is good and that bed increase and all of that is good, but not at the expense of the integrity of the county and the rights of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Anybody else like to address this on this item? <coughs> okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for action. I, I would <clears throat> move the recommended actions. 
second. I'll second. <clears throat> I right, just wanted to make a comment also. So we have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Leopold, please. Well, I, I, I think uh, the testimony uh, highlights a, a big challenge that we have, which is um, people want these services, they want us to have these services, they want us to treat people, but they don't want them to be anywhere where they live. Um, and the state has passed a law that says that six bed um, facilities can go into neighborhoods and the county can't stop it. I know in the first district, we have a, uh, probably the highest per capita r number of uh, sober living environments. They, they don't cause a problem in the community um, uh, and they provide an incredibly useful service and they allow people to return to the community at, at their homes. So. I think that w th this is a big challenge for us as policymakers and po ch challenge for us as community, but there has to be a place where people can receive treatment, uh, whatever that treatment is, um, and, uh, and we'll continue to support um, uh, good projects that, uh, that can really make a difference in the community. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. The board's gonna take a short 10-minute uh, break. We'll be back at 10.30 to deal with item nine.
We will move on to item nine, which is to consider an ordinance enacting Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 4.22, imposing a transactions and use tax or a sales tax in an unincorporated area to adopt resolutions accepting 1,437,500 from the voter approved measure G sales tax and 55,811 from the Mental Health Services Act funding, approve addition and funding of various positions to address county's critical unmet needs and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the memo, the ordinance enacting the, the uh, chapter 4.22, a resolution for the sales tax revenue, a resolution for the Mental Health Services Act funding and the plant fund uh, budget adjustments. Uh, good morning, Ms. Coburn, welcome back. Good morning, Chair Friend and members of the board. I'm Nicole Coburn, Assistant County Administrative Officer. So this past August, as you'll recall, the, our office provided your board with a report on revenue options and funding strategies to address the county's critical unmet needs. Based on the recommendations that were in that report, the board placed a measure on the November ballot to increase by ordinance the sales tax on retail transactions in the unincorporated area of the county by one half percent for 12 years. On November 6, Santa Cruz County voters overwhelmingly approved the sales tax known as Measure G. Given the measure's passage, the board must adopt a, an ordinance to establish the half cent sales tax. The ordinance before the board enacts chapter 4.22 of the Santa Cruz County Code imposing the transactions and use tax, which will be administered by the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration. A second reading of the ordinance will be scheduled on December 11th based on the recommendations today, and upon board adoption, the tax will become operative within 110 days on April 1st, 2019. The sales tax increase in the unincorporated area will generate ongoing revenue of approximately $5.75 million annually. And as a result, um, with approximately 25% of sales tax revenue being received in the current fiscal year, we'll receive $1,437,500 during the fourth quarter. These revenues are going to be used to fund critical programs at mid-year for approximately $437,500. This includes funding for positions with the Focus Intervention Team and Parks Maintenance and Recreation. The remaining balance of $1 million will be used to augment funding for needed critical parks capital improvements. It is therefore recommended that the board consider the ordinance enacting Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 4.22 imposing the sales tax, adopt resolutions accepting the unanticipated revenue from Measure G and the Mental Health Services Act funding, approve the addition and funding of various positions to address the county's critical unmet needs, and take related actions that are outlined in the memorandum of our office. Thank you, Ms. Coburn. Are there questions from uh, supervisors on this issue? Good morning, Supervisor Caput. You have a question? No. I. Uh I'll make a quick comment. Uh, I'll, I'd like to hear, I guess we'll hear from uh, Jeff if you'll be yeah. talking to or no? Okay. Anyway, it's uh, it's good to see some money going into the parks, uh, uh, part of this whole uh, uh, tax, and uh, it's a critical need, I believe, in the county, especially something we're going to have to address in the future. We have housing going in, but we need parks, and uh, It'd be nice to have parks that are actually walking distance to uh, neighborhoods and uh, that'll cut down a little bit on traffic and it'll have something for families and youth to go to and hopefully we can get this uh, going. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, we'll open it up for the community. Are there members of the community that, that would like to address us on this item? Item nine. Thank you, Becky Steinbrunner, resident of rural Aptos. Thank you, Supervisor Caput, for bringing up the issue of parks. And I want to point out to you, to the board, that in the massive zoning changes that you approved, there are no areas approved or designated for parks to address those dense developments. I uh, just want to, again, f uh, file my protest against this action. Um, had I have known that I could, uh, for free, put an argument against it on the ballot, I would have. 
but I was under the impression that I would have to pay hundreds of dollars to do that, and I don't have that money. That was one of the comments I often heard in the community, well, there's no opposition, but there, there, there is. <laughs> it just wasn't clear that the public could post it and take part in that process and get some facts out to the public. I want to tell you and talk with you about the county fire budget. Many people have now thought that Measure G will fund the county fire budget when it will not. Zero money from the general fund where this sales tax money will go, will go to county fire. Zero money to county fire budget. When I spoke with your board um, uh, shortly after you put it on the ballot, I, I raised protest of, uh, supervi of uh, Mr. Palacio, <laughs> he's like a supervisor, um, delaying an action that County Fire wanted to take to put an increase of County Service Area 48, which does fund <coughs> the County Fire budget, um, on the ballot in November, and he postponed that until the spring. I think that's really um, shocking, and I think the voters need to know about that. What I got after that testimony was an email from Ms. Mowbray from that office stating all the different things that the general fund does fund in county fire. The county fire advisory commission looked at that and said that's not true. The county fire has not made use of the county radio repair services for years. The other issues uh, raised on that that is supportive of County Fire from the general fund are uh, s services that County Fire is billed for. So it's not a free thing from general fund at all. So your board has put fraudulent information out for voters and now they think they've funded County Fire budget when they have not. Mr. Beaton came to the last Fire Department Advisory Commission meeting with plans to put perhaps on a mail-out ballot next spring, a county service area 48 increase. And uh, that's, that's terrible. <laughs> what I also want to say is that regarding the parks, um, going back to the fire, I'm, I will fight that because your board needs to appropriate part of Proposition 172 public serve safety money, $17 million that rolls in this county. Can I have one more minute, please? Thank you. No, Ms. Steinberg, thank you. I also just want to protest the parks thank you, Ms. project because the bridge will not fit there at the farm park. Thank you, Ms. A civil Steinbrenner. Engineer has confirmed that the Ms. Steinbrenner? Ms. Steinbrenner? Ms. Steinbrenner, your time is up. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, hello. Um, putting out uh, misleading information to voters and omitting significant facts, some of which were just stated now by Becky Steinbrunner, is really, uh, really a mockery of a, a voting system. And I certainly didn't know that this required, it says you're getting about one and a half million for Measure G, and that this half cent sales tax for the unincorporated area where I live, I think I already pay enough taxes. Um, yeah, I don't, did the voters know that this would be tacked on additionally? Um, I, I'm, I'm really against this, and um, it's disturbing to me to see what our taxes are going for. I really don't mind. I feel it's good. I'm a retired school teacher. I taught 30 years public service, working with little people, trying to develop their potentialities. I'm all for funding schools and parks and, um, you know, environmental, um, and what do you call it, conservation. <laughs> but the money I see that the county spends with the taxes collected is extremely disturbing to me. Extremely, and seems so uh, exclusionary of uh, defending, protecting the public well-being, like big developments like the one in Aptos. Is it about three million of our taxpayer money going 
to Swenson developers and to move the bus stop. What's going on here? I'm totally, I'm, I'm opposed to this. Also, when you have public hearings, by definition, the public needs to be there. The public needs to be able to attend. By having your meetings at nine in the morning, hardly any of us can come. And I wouldn't be here if I, would be, if I were teaching. I'd be with 20 or so children. But Watsonville, Santa Cruz, Scotts Valley, Capitola, they all have evening meetings. You need to have evening meetings to have the public even be able to be present. So those are my comments. I think this is outrageous. And, um, and questions of the legality when people vote on something and they're misled, not informed correctly, that's a problem, thank you. Anybody else like to address us on Measure G? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a, a, an important day uh, for the County of Santa Cruz uh, because uh, the board has worked for the last couple of years to strengthen the financial foundation uh, of the county, but we heard about uh, uh, requests for services that we didn't have the resources for. And the county, which is, uh, uh, which is not only provides county services, but uh, uh, municipal services for about half the population of the county, um, has never really had the same uh, uh, funding uh, uh, resources as, as uh, cities have had. So with the passage of legislation, the county was able to consider uh, 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 this sales tax measure. We worked hard uh, in this campaign to uh, share information about this. It wasn't just the Board of Supervisors, it was our sheriff, it was the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, it was uh, park supporters, um, it, it was um, loads of organizations, uh, whether they be uh, political organizations, human care agencies, labor unions, business groups, um, uh, local uh, press, uh, there was broad support for this measure. Uh, so the idea that somehow we hoodwink people, well, you have to say that we'd hoodwink not only all those organizations, but uh, members of the, uh, of the state legislature, uh, city councils, office of educations. Um, it's just not, it's not realistic to think that, that somehow we weren't uh, uh, straightforward in ter terms of what this measure was gonna do. Um, this measure will help us deal with some of the critical issues that we heard here just today. Um, uh, dealing with mental health or behavioral health issues, uh, dealing with homelessness, uh, uh, supporting our parks uh, in a big way, uh, supporting public safety. Um, these uh, resources will be critical towards meeting the needs of the community. And so this board heard from the community and we found a way to, to, to take care of them and we will continue to do that. Um, I'm proud of the work uh, that uh, this board did and the support uh, from all five members of the board. Uh, uh, Shaw Ramey Wright, who was the uh, campaign manager for the campaign, did an outstanding job, as well as David Sonnenberg, who was our treasurer and members of the committee. Um, I also wanna thank the, the, all the people who walked precincts uh, to uh, pass Measure G. Uh, I think it was uh, critically important to get the word out and we, and we did that through the campaign. Uh, so I'm very excited to, to be here at this day and I would uh, move all the recommended actions. I'll second that. I'd like to add just one thing that- so A motion from Leopold and a second from McPherson. Please, Supervisor McPherson. I, I'd like to give additional direction that we have a report back on um, six months about the FIT program and how it's working, uh, the implementation of it. It's a new team that's up and running. Uh, that was a very important issue for the people who were considering this Measure G um, last, uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, a month ago now almost. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I think we need some more information to just to get a, a sense of how it's going and uh, how we're implementing it as we had promised. We do have an oversight committee to see the, oversee these, uh, the functions of what, where this money is going. And I think that's fitting and proper and I think the people uh, appreciate that. The motioner. 
you're comfortable uh, with additional I have, direction? I have no problem uh, with that. And just for clarity's sake, uh, we are the oversight committee. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a separate oversight committee with this measure. And uh, given the timing of that, it might make sense to just make that during budget hearings, during when the sheriff would do that presentation anyway, if you're acceptable to that, because that six months would be the same time. Yeah. Uh, we also plan to uh, come to the board uh, prior to budget hearings with some of the protocols regarding the FIT team, the focused intervention team, as, it, as we roll that program out. And then we'd happy, be happy to report uh, back as well during budget hearings. Thank you, Supervisor Caput. Uh, I'll just comment, uh, the, the comments that you made are, are correct. We do have a responsibility to spend this uh, money uh, wisely and uh, the responsibility is with the Board of Supervisors and uh, there will be transparency on that. We're gonna show how the money is gonna be distributed. Uh, and something that's related to uh, parks and also mental health and everything uh, that it seems like no matter what project or program that we have, uh, there's a lot of support, but then there's always the argument, not in my neighborhood, right? And uh, that's true with uh, everything that we're doing. And we are careful, we're trying to preserve neighborhoods, we're trying to make them better. And uh, if we don't address uh, problems that we have before us, like a lack of parks, a lack of mental health facilities, a lack of safe homes and all that, if we have nowhere to put them, then we have no program. So this, this is uh, one, it's a 12-year tax. It's not a 30-year tax, not a 40-year tax. And uh, it's, uh, it's one that I think that we can spend the money wisely, and I, I agree with the amendment to, or the recommendation to add to the uh, uh, approval. Thank you, Supervisor Coonerty. Yeah, so um, I just want to take a moment and first of all thank the voters, uh, the confidence of the voters to uh, pay a small amount, an extra half cent, uh, in order to get these benefits is a tremendous um, honor and a testament to how much this community is willing to invest to improve the lives of others. Uh, and then just to be clear, because I think it's really important that we um, maintain honesty and transparency that this budget item, if you read it, uh, what it does is it spends money on parks and parks maintenance, just as we promised the voters, and it hires three sheriff's deputies uh, and three mental health workers to do the outreach and reduce uh, the really significant impacts that we're seeing in our community, as well as spending the money um, on, on the other priorities that we talked about. And so uh, that's the action that we're taking today. It's a it's a, it's a promise that we made the voters and we're fulfilling that promise and then we'll be hearing ongoing reports and most importantly, um, seeing great projects develop in this community and increase public safety in this community uh, when, when people need, it, need those services the most. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on to item 10, which is to consider final reappointments of Julia Hill and Al Smith to the library, Law Library Board of Trustees for terms to expire December 31st, 2019. I move approval. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. Anybody in the community like to address us on the final reappointments of these two individuals to the Law Library? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? passes unanimously. Item 11 is to consider final appointment of Jorge Suarez to the, wa the Workforce Development Board as a representative of a local business for a term to expire June 30th of 2022. Anybody in the community like to address us on this appointment? I move approval. Second. A motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Caput. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, we have a closed session item. Is anything anticipated to be reportable at a closed session? No. Would anybody from the community like to address us on the closed session item before we go into closed session? All right, the board will go into closed session. We appreciate Community TV and the Sentinel for covering and all those that attended today.